Hey gang, welcome to week 8 of Code Club Year 2. In this final week of Code Club, we're going to add a couple cool new animations to our game, show you how to edit the graphics in your game, and show you a level editor so that you can add as many levels as you want. Open up another browser window and log on to Cloud9 so that you can follow along. Have fun and let's start coding! We finally have a fully usable game, even if it is a little primitive. This week we'll add a couple other animations that make it look a little better, and then we'll talk about some of the important things you guys have been asking about, which is how can you replace the graphics with some of your own graphics that you've created or downloaded from the internet, and how can you add more levels without having to know how to edit all that JSON code to create levels. One way we can make our game look a little bit better is right now when our hero walks around, he looks like he's just standing there. We can make him look like he's running, so we'll add some new animations to do that. In order to make the hero animated, we have a sprite sheet for him, and it's kind of complicated. It's got a bunch of frames that all look pretty similar, but they're different, and they can make him look like he's running around. We're going to do this by making it part of the update function for the hero, which if you remember is what runs 60 times a second and updates all the time. And what we're going to do is make it so that when the hero updates, it checks which animation should be running to make sure that he's running or stopped or whatever, whichever position he should be in and that he's going in the right direction. If we switch over to the code in main.js and scroll down to our preload function, right now we're loading the hero as a basic image. We need to delete that line of code that's loading the hero as an image and create a, sp a sprite sheet for the hero. So it's got the same name as what was up here, so we need to make sure to delete that image load, and instead we'll load this hero sprite sheet with all the parameters in it that make it a sprite sheet. The next thing we need to do is go up to our hero constructor. Remember, this is what runs the first time you ever create a, um, a object in JavaScript, it runs the constructor. So we need to go into here and create all those animations. So there's an animation for stop, an animation for run, an animation for jump, for fall, for die. And then what we're gonna do is tell it to play the stop animation by default. So the stop, if we look at our sprite sheet, is just this frame. It will make it look exactly like it looks now with our um, single frame that we were using previously. And then, you know, the run, it goes between frames one and two and it goes at eight frames per second and it loops when it's done. Jump changes it to number frame number three, fall changes it to number four, and then die switches back and forth between five and six several times at 12 frames per second, and it doesn't loop. So we just added a bunch of animations to our hero by putting them into the constructor. The next thing we need to do is add a new function to the hero that's gonna calculate which animation the hero should currently be playing. If we scroll down to the bottom of our hero stuff, right before the um, spider constructor, we'll put the new code there and it's going to be called hero.prototype.getAnimationName. If you look at the code for getAnimationName, it's basically an advanced if-else test that looks at various aspects of our hero object to see which animation it should display. And it defaults to the stop animation because we're saying let name equal stop first. The first part of this if test, this line here, looks at a property of the hero called alive. And alive is a built in to phaser property that every sprite gets and it just tells you whether that sprite is alive or dead. And what'll happen is when the hero touches a spider and the spider kills the, uh, the hero, that means that alive is gonna be set to false. So what we're saying is if the if not alive, then set the animation name to die. And just a quick note here, I'm not sure we talked about this yet, but in JavaScript, this exclamation point means not. So it's saying if the hero sprite is not alive, set the animation name to die. Phaser has a lot of these built-in properties like this dot alive for a sprite. And for example, it has a health property, it has a damage property, and they determine things like how healthy your hero is. Um, a cool thing is that they interact. So if you use the health property, which we're not doing, but if we were to use the health property and say every time you hit a spider, your health went down by 10. Well, what would happen is when your health hits zero, then it would set the alive property to false because it knows that if your health is zero, you're not alive anymore. So it's not something we're going to do, but it's something you could add to your game if you wanted to. 
The next part of the if test looks at the sprite's velocity on the y-axis, which you remember is up and down. And if the velocity on the y-axis is less than zero, that means that we're jumping. So we're going to set the animation name to jump. Um, it sounds kind of backwards that when you're jumping, the Y velocity would be less than zero, but that's just how phaser works. If it's less than zero, it means you're going up. If it's greater than zero, that means you're going down. Therefore, if we look at the next line of the if test, we see that it's checking if the Y velocity is greater than or equal to zero. And if it is, it sets it to falling. Because if it's greater, if the Y velocity is greater than zero, that means it's going down and that means you're falling. But we also need to check that the bottom of the sprite is not touching something because if something is affected by gravity, um, even though it's touching a platform, its velocity could, its Y velocity could potentially be a positive number, even if it's not moving anywhere. So we need to check that the Y velocity is greater than or equal to zero, but then also that we're not touching something on the bottom of the sprite. Otherwise we could still be standing on a platform and not falling. So if both of these things are true, if the Y velocity is greater than or equal to zero and our bottom part of our sprite isn't touching something, that means we change the animation to be the fall animation. The last part of the if test here looks at the X velocity, the one going back and forth this way. And this is just checking if that velocity is not equal to zero. And if it's not equal to zero, that means we're running. So we change the animation name to running. But we also make sure that the bottom of the hero is touching something because if the bottom of our sprite is touching something that probably means we're running when we have an x velocity if the bottom of the sprite is not touching something it probably means that we're falling or jumping and so we don't want our animation to look like run we want it to look like jump or fall so we test to make sure that the there's an x velocity that isn't zero and that the bottom is touching um something and that means we set the name to run the last thing we need to do in the function is return the name. So we're, we're setting it here. We're setting it to either stop, die, jump, fall, or run. But in order for it to be useful to the other parts of our game, we need to return the name that was chosen out of this if test. The last thing we need to do is add the update function to our hero, which is going to make sure that we're running the proper animation. So we're going to do it up here right before the hero move function. We're going to add a hero prototype update function. And this function is really simple. The first thing it does is it gets the animation name that should be running for our hero. Then it does an if test and says, is the current animation name the same as the animation name that I got that should be the animation name? And if they're not the same, play the animation name that it should be. So the if test says, if current animation name is not equal to the proper animation name, play the proper animation name. And remember that for the update function, it runs very, very fast, 60 times a second. So 60 times a second, the game is checking and making sure that the hero is running the proper animation. So if you are running and you fall off a cliff or something, it's going to update right away to show that you're going to be using the fall animation instead of the run animation. So now that we have our animations and our update function for our hero, we can save the game and go back to our code and refresh it here. And now if I run, it looks like he's running. If I jump, it looks like he's jumping. And if he falls, he looks like he's falling. The problem is, if I walk the other direction, it looks like he's doing the moonwalk. He, he walks the same no matter which way he's going. And how do we fix that? We could do it by making a bunch of new images in our sprite sheet. You know, we have a sprite sheet where all the images are facing to the right. Um, we could add a bunch of images to make them point in the other direction, but that would be a lot of extra graphical work that we don't really need to do because we can use the magic of coding to make it mirror the image and flip it around looking like it's going the other direction. The way you mirror something in Phaser is to change the scale property of the sprite to be a negative number. So the scale of a sprite in phaser is how big it is. If you have it, the scale set to 100%, that means the image is full size and it's facing the direction that you specify in the image file or the spreadsheet. If you were to set the scale to be 50%, that means it would um, smush the image to be about half the size that it would be um, in your image file. 
So if we change it to negative 100%, that's going to make it go all the way down through zero, which would make the image disappear, and then turn the image around. So if we set it to minus 100%, it's going to be its full size, just a mirror image, flipped image of what it should look like. The way we do this in our game is we'll add some new code to the uh, hero's move function. And here's the code. And basically what it's doing is it's got an if test in here that looks at the X velocity of the uh, hero sprite. And that's the left and right velocity. And what it does is if the X velocity is less than zero, that means our hero is moving to the left. And if he's moving to the left, we set the scale on the X axis to be negative one. Setting the scale on the x-axis to negative 1 gives us that mirror image that we're looking for. If the velocity on the x-axis is greater than 0, that means that the scale is set to 1 on the x-axis. So that gives us the normal image that we want. Now it's weird because I've been saying negative 100 and positive 100. And these are functionally equivalent. Saying minus 1 is the same as saying negative 100. Saying 1 is the same as saying 100. And it's because... Um, phaser, when you set the scale, uses percent, uses decimals instead of percentages. So you can't say minus 100%. That's not valid code in JavaScript or phaser. You have to say minus 1, and that's equal to minus 100%. If I wanted to say like 50%, I'd have to say 0.5, which is the equivalent of 50%. But we want it to be negative 1 so that it flips our image for us. If we save our code now and go back and reload our preview window. Now when I move the hero to the right, he's pointing to the right. When I move him to the left, he's pointing to the left. This is exactly what we want. And it even works when he's jumping and falling. If I uh, move over here, I'll move to the left and then jump. He looks like he's jumping to the left even. The scale is working exactly how we want. The last thing we need to do is make use of the die animation that we added. If you remember correctly, we put that in there, but there's nowhere that tells it to use that animation yet. So let's flip back to our code, and we're going to add a new function. Um, we'll just add it at the end, right before spider again. A new function to our hero called die. If we look at this code, the first two lines are easy. This one dis, uh, sets the hero to be not alive, which if you remember in our get animation name function, sets the animation to be called die. And then it disables the body of the um, hero, and that makes it so that it can't interact with other uh, sprites and that it can't move around anymore. The next couple of lines make use of phaser signals like we talked about in one of the previous sessions. And what it does is it plays the die animation and waits for it to complete. And once it completes, it kills the hero from the game. Nothing in our code tells it to use this hero die function yet. So we need to go down to on hero versus enemy. And in on hero versus enemy, this else test is what tells our game what to do when the hero dies. And right now it's saying play the stomp sound and restart the game on the current level. So we're going to take these two lines of code out and replace them with this chunk of code. So the first thing we're going to do is call that hero die function, which plays our die animation. Then it plays that stomp sound. Then this line here waits for the hero to the hero kill function to finish. So remember, in hero.die, we call hero.kill, which kills it out of our game. This waits for that kill to finish happening and then restarts again on the current level. This last line of code here is not something we need to worry about. It's just there's a bug in phaser and this fixes that bug for us. It's nothing we need to worry about. The important parts are now we're calling that hero die function and then we're waiting for the hero kill to finish before we restart the level. If we save our code and go back to our preview, and we go up to where a spider can kill us, if you look, it's playing that animation. The spider walked right through the animation as it was playing because we disabled our sprite, but it played the animation, it played the little sound, and then restarted the level on the current level. One other thing we could add to our game is making it so that when you change between levels, it fades in and out. This is just something that makes the game look a little more polished, but for me, it lets me introduce a new topic, which is Phaser's camera. Um, every game in Phaser gets a camera associated with it, and it acts like the view into your world. There are lots of cool effects you can do by changing the view of the camera. So for example, right now, we just have a one static view that lets us view our entire game world. 
but you could do something where you have the camera follow a specific sprite around. And you could do, um, if you play a game like Flappy Bird, that's kind of what happens is there. As your sprite moves across the screen, the camera follows that sprite across the screen. You could have the camera shake in response to some action. So, for example, if when I go up and touch an enemy, you know, we could have the camera shake and it would make that would be part of our die animation. Um, obviously, fading in and fading out are two kind of simple actions we can perform. So that's what we're going to do to show this concept of using the camera in phaser. First, we're going to add the code to make the levels fade in from black. And the way we do that, if we switch back to the code in playstate.create, right at the top of create, we're going to add this new camera flash function. And what camera flash does is it tells the camera to start by displaying a certain color and then fading that color away until you can see the visible game objects. So we're going to start with color 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 which is black in JavaScript. JavaScript and, you know, HTML web programming languages like to use these weird numbers instead of names for colors. So this means black. So it's going to start the screen as black and then fade the black away until we can see our screen. So let's save this and reload over here again. And now it looks like it's fading in from black to load our game window. To make the game fade from the game back into black when we switch between levels, we can go back over into our code and in the on hero versus door function, right now we're just saying to restart the game. What we're going to do instead is take this line of code out put these new lines of code in. And so we're saying fade to black. That's what this is. So it's saying camera fade to black. And then we're adding a new event handler that says when the fade is complete, that is when we switch to the new level. So if we save our code again, go back and reload our window. So we fade in, we go grab the key, go to the door. Now it fades out and loads up the next level. Now I'm going to talk about something that you guys have been asking about pretty much since week one, which is how do you change the graphics of the game? So there's a couple steps. First, you need to upload some new graphics into Cloud9 and put them in the proper folder, and then we can edit the game code to point to the new graphics. The hard part of this is you have to know how to create graphics or where to get graphics. And for me, not being an artist, that's the hard part. Writing all the code to do it is easy. Making a cool graphic that looks like a walking spider is really, really difficult, or any of these other graphics. Especially in the context of this game, which is already pretty much created, you're going to need graphics that are pretty much the same size as what we already have. So if you want a different hero character, you need to create a hero graphic that's pretty much the same size as this. And if you want it to look like it's running, you need to create a sprite sheet that looks, you know, has the same frames with the same sizes that are pretty much what we have in the hero sprite sheet right now, unless you want to get into editing the code about how your sprite sheet works, which you could do if we go up and, um, if we look at the sprite sheet for the hero, you know, if you create a new one and you can put in the proper parameters for what the um, individual frames of the sprite sheet look like, that's fine. More power to you. I'm going to show you some real simple replacements just so you can see what to do. I'm going to replace um, the background image and I'm going to replace the ground image just so you can see what, they, what it looks like if you wanted to change some of the graphics. And the graphics I'm using are just things I downloaded from the internet and then I corrected them in an image editing program to make sure they were the right size. So like I said, we're going to upload new background and ground images. And the first thing you have to do is actually put the files up onto Cloud9 so that it can see them. So the way you do that is over in this left side where it lists all of our files, click where it says images. And that's going to tell the upload where to put it. So then we go to file and say upload local files and then click select files. And that's going to pop up this thing, which looks at our hard drive on our on our local computer. And so I have a new background image. I'm going to select that, and that's going to upload it. And then I have a new ground image, so I'm going to upload that. And then if we look in the files over here underneath images, we have new background and new ground. But our game still doesn't know about them. If I were to, you know, go back and refresh here, it's... Oops, it's still using the previous background and the previous ground. What we need to do is in preload where we're loading our images, we need to say 
new background and we need to say new ground. And now the game knows that these are the images we want to use. So we save here, we refresh here, and now we have this new funky background and this new funky ground. And because we changed the, for the entire game when we switch levels or whatever, it's going to use those same images. The last thing I want to show you for Code Club Year 2 is how to add new levels to our game. Right now it's a cool game, but only with two levels, that's kind of boring. So I'm going to show you a way you can add as many levels as you want, and you can be as creative as you want in making them, and you don't need to know how to edit those JSON files directly. So the first thing you need to do is go back over in the left side here and find editor.html, double click on it to open it up, then go to preview and live preview editor.html. If you go to the preview for that editor.html file, it looks a lot like our normal game, except there's only the hero, the door, and a key, and then some new icons and stuff down at the bottom that look like our other game elements. And the reason that it's, it's like that is because the hero, the door, and the key are things we can't delete. We have to have those for our level to work. But now we can move them around on the screen to wherever we want, except the hero and the door both have gravity enabled because they have to be touching something on the bottom to start the game. If we want to add other elements to our game, like I want a platform or a coin or a spider, I can just double click down in this bar and that will add them to our game. And then I can drag them to wherever I want. So this is how we can create new levels for our game. Oh, spiders also have gravity enabled, by the way, because spiders also need to be touching something when, when the game starts. So now I have a very simple level together. I probably want one more here, otherwise I won't be able to get over. I'm going to try something like this. Just trying to make a game that's actually usable for us. Um, let's put this guy up over here. I'll we'll put this guy up over here. Okay, so I think this is something we should be able to win technically. Um, so now I created a new level. Oh, one other thing I want to show you is if I have something, that, so let's say I added a spider and he's over here, but I decide I don't want him, you can just double click him and he'll go away. So to get things into our game, we double click down here. To remove them from our game, we double click wherever it's sitting. And then we can't remove the hero, we can't remove the key, we can't remove the door. So now I have this cool level I created, how do I get back into my game? Well, you'll notice there's a big blue save button here. If you click it, it doesn't really look like it does anything. But what it does is it copies data off into the clipboard. And once you have that data in the clipboard, you can go back into your game code and in the data directory, you want to right click here and we can say um, new file and we'll call it level02.json and create this new JSON file and open it up and then we just hit control V or you can go to edit paste and that will paste in the code that we copied out of here. So when you click save that copies the code for the JSON of the um, level into your clipboard and then you paste it into a new JSON file over here and then hit control S and that'll save your JSON file. The last thing we need to do is to tell our game to use the new file. So if we go back to main.js all the way close to the top after we create our hero and our spider and stuff we have the level count and right now the level count is two but now we have three levels. We have level zero, we have level one, and we have level two. So our level count is now going to be three and then down in um, where we uh, pre-create all of our assets, we need to copy one of these lines. And so we have level 0, level 1. Now we need level 2. And we need to point it at level 2. So now we have three levels. We're loading data for three levels. And it's important that this file name has to match what you created over here. So if I just call this, you know, um, mat.json, as long as I say mat.json here, it will know how to load it. The important part is this has to follow the same pattern where it's level, colon, and then a number, and the numbers have to be in order, 0, 1, 2, because that's how the game knows to switch to the next level. Now if I save this, 
and switch back over to my level preview, now I can, uh, you know, go through this first level and go through the second level that was already there, which hopefully I don't die on the way to my last level. But I can flip through these two levels real quick, and then you'll be able to see, now here's the level I added, and it, it worked to flip to that next level, because in the code, I named it level one, I'm sorry, level two, and it knows to go to the current level plus one. So the previous one is one, it goes to the level plus one, and that makes it go to two. And there we are. So now I have the key, and I should be able to go to this, and it'll loop us back around, because that's the last level right now. So the last thing I want to show you is that JavaScript and Phaser don't really care what you call these levels outside of a very small set of parameters. So I created this real simple level here. I'm going to click Save on it, and then I'll go over here, and I will create a new data file. Call it mat.json, and open it up, and paste my code in there. Save it, and then go back to main.js. So now I'm going to copy this line of code, and paste the new one in there. And here's the tricky part. I'm going to call this level one, and it's going to be mat.json. Now, what was previously level one is now going to be level two. What was previously level two is now going to be level three. And this is just to show you that JSON and Phaser don't care what these names are. They don't care that they match what's over here. All it cares about is that these are level, colon, and then a number, and then the numbers are in order, 0, 1, 2, 3, however many you have. And then the other thing we need to do so that this is going to work is we need to go and up our level count by one more. So let me save this, switch back to the game real quick, reload. So here's the zero level again. It's the same one we've been working with. But now when it flips, it's flipping to the simple level, and now it's going to flip to what was previously level 2, which is now level 3. So I just wanted to show you that the, the names that you give the stuff when you're preloading it doesn't matter. All that matters is this and the level count number. All right, that's it for week 8 and for Code Club Year 2. I hope you enjoyed it.